So we assigned different teams a topic and said, go through the photos that we now know we have and have them tell a story about Butte's history. So one of the teams was assigned to tell the story of how to feed Butte, how Butte was fed when its population was huge. Where did the food come from? Where did people shop? And they gathered together this group of photos, and there were so many of them that I gave a presentation um, a couple of months ago on Feeding Butte Part 1, and I did it around Thanksgiving to Christmas time because it was Feeding Butte in Hard Times, of which Butte has had many, and so we just focused on the various groups that took care of minors on strikes, widows who had lost their breadwinner, um, just all that. And so this is part two, and this is focusing on how people, where people got their food. And I titled it From Independent Markets to Supermarkets, and basically um, looked at the at the way people shopped and where they got food from 1900 up to 1970. So, starting with bread. In 1900, there were 24 bakeries, and most people are familiar with the Haller building that is still standing on Park Street and that now houses the Hummingbird uh, Cafe. So Haller was a German immigrant, and his uh, bakery was open by 1900. All the other ones in that list were ones that have been long gone. Um, by 1910, there were fewer retail bakeries. Um, there were 16 bakeries listed, but three were big, large, what, we, what later on they're going to call them wholesale bakeries. I included that there was one at 1125 Woolman Street because in 1910, that was way out of town. That was um, beyond where the IC Church is now, and the IC Church wouldn't be built until 1906. Wow. Well, the church itself, the school was built in 1906, the church not until 1930. But this bakery located there, way out of town, and it was a big, um, big enterprise. Um, and I just thought that interesting that, that that bakery was built that far out. Um, I had to skip. I was trying to do every 10 years, and there is no uh, yearbook for 1920. After World War I, the 1918 yearbook, um, another one doesn't get published until 1923. So 1918, there's seven retail bakeries and only one wholesale bakery, and we'll have a picture of it. 1930, we have 19 retail bakeries, um, four wholesale bakeries, but one of those wholesale bakeries was only making donuts. In 1940, we're down to 12 retail bakeries, but we have 10 wholesale bakeries. So these wholesale bakeries are the ones that are supplying bread to all the neighborhood grocery stores. And um, uh, 1940, on my 10-year cycle, is the first year that Town Talk shows up, as, and they listed it as a wholesale bakery. So they not only serve people from their storefront, but they also deliver to um, neighborhoods, neighborhood grocery stores. And then you see that by 1949, the number of retail bakeries starts dwindling and dwindling. Um, by 1970, there's nine bakeries left. They didn't separate them out by wholesale and retail in the 1970 directory. But um, we're going to see this trend through all the food sources from small, independent neighborhood things and then as supermarkets started offering in-store bakeries, in-store everything, these smaller ones started to disappear. So this is the Home Baking Company. It was located at 107 Olympia Avenue. So Olympia Avenue, if you're going across Front Street and you go around the bend to Harrison Avenue, there was a little street right off there called Olympia Avenue, which was named for the brewery. The Olympia Brewery was there, brewing Olympia beer in these early days. And the street wasn't very long, but the other thing on it besides the brewery was the home baking company. And as you can see by there, I don't know what year that this, um, this photo was taken, and they were actually there before 1910 because they showed up in the 1910 yearbook, or 
city directory. And, um, and then by 1940, they were gone. So um, that's the rough time period that they were offering. And, um, and there is a picture of the interior of that bakery we just looked at. And you can see um, brick ovens. Were these, were these heated by electricity or natural gas in 1910? No, they were not. So these are either wood-fired or coal-fired ovens that are um, baking the bread in natural gas wouldn't come to Butte until the 1930s. Um, electricity was here, but not efficient for running things like huge baking ovens at that point in time. And this is Eddie's Bakery, and we're all I'm pretty sure everybody in here is familiar with Eddie's because they were around for such a long time. Um, they were already there in the 1920 uh, city directory. Their first location is there on South Colorado Street, which is one block east of Maine. So you can see we're looking up at, ooh, is this like the Maywa building or something on Mercury Street? So they're um, just south of that in the 200 block south. And they were also a wholesale bakery. And you can see all their delivery trucks lined up in this shot, ready to um, deliver bread. Yes. Are any of these buildings still standing? Uh, yes. Walsh, Walsh Construction. Walsh Construction, somebody just said. Kitty? I have a question. It says they're moved to 1200 East Front around 1960. Mm -hmm. it, might, it was a little bit earlier than that, because when I was a Girl Scout, which was a long time ago. <laughs> um, Mrs. Gillespie and Mrs. Uh, Quinn took the Girl Scout troop to the Nettie's Bakery on East Front for a tour. It was brand new. Um, we have construction yeah. photos of it. Smithers documented. He showed okay. the, uh, and kept the equipment um, building it, and it was late 50s when okay. they were building that's it. That's so we that's doing. why I put uh, 1200 East okay. Front around 1960, yeah. because his photos of construction were in the late 50s. Jim? I live right there. Yes, you do, I've Jim. I raised there. That was early 50s when that was built. Oh, early 50s. We would sit in school in Monroe in the spring. Okay. And they'd be baking and all that. Bacon. So they moved oh. to East Front Street around 1950. So I got my. I love this audience. It knows more than I do. And I'm throwing these things together and trying to check it out and see. Okay, perfect. Can I ask you one more question? Yes. Where's Park Street? You can't see Park Street, just like you can. That's the lane. And then yes. So when you go up from the south, Main Street goes all the way up to Park. But if you're one block over, you come up and you hit Mercury Street and Galena Street, and the street doesn't go through to Park. Uh, Dakota did not used to go through to Park. And then after a fire burned this uh, one of the original buildings along Park Street, they didn't replace one of the buildings that was next to where Terminal Market is yeah. and made a little tiny Dakota Street so that you could oh, get wow. through from park to street below. What is the main street that comes out on the corner of that building? Is that? Yeah. Yeah. This is Mercury Street. Mercury Street. Mercury Street. Mercury Street. Mercury Street. Galena. So if you went this way, you'd run into the intersection of Maine. This is on Colorado, and Colorado and Maine run parallel to each other, one block. What's the liquor store from there? The Park Street liquor store? Yeah. Oh, you'd have to go. Um, you'd have to go from Colorado west to Dakota and west to Montana. So there's the, the four parallel streets in there are Main Street. Colorado Street, Dakota I Street, the and then Montana. I was just wondering if you look there, but we're back in my building. Okay. This 6% um, is on top of the, well, it's gone now. Um, it was the Clark Hotel, and it later, it had a 6% when it was a bank building. And in our day, the Bronx was located on the bottom floor of it on the corner of Dakota and okay. Park Street. 
and the big the J.C. Penney fire took out that building along with five others. Wasn't the Prudential mm -hmm. Federal there? Prudential Federal, that's what the 6% is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it was something else before it was Prudential Federal, I can't remember who it was. Okay, Eddie Bakery, I had to throw this one in. This is a parade in 1932, and Eddie's Bakery had introduced a new product that they were making there at their bakery, and it was called Old Plantation Donuts. And um, recently in the news, we had, um, we had some, some guys getting in trouble, some political figures getting in trouble for putting on blackface in the 1970s or 80s. But in 1932, this was not considered a racist thing to do. Not at all. So these people were not making fun of black people. It was just, you know, you see pictures of Halloween parties or whatever. It was like dressing up like a cowboy. You wouldn't consider it racist if somebody dressed up like a cowboy. Or an Indian. Or an Indian. I was Aunt Jemima many, many years. Okay. Yes. She's not racist. I, I guarantee that that is not racist. So she dressed up as Aunt Jemima. So, so I, I had to throw that one in. And the girls have the donuts in their baskets, which they handed out along the parade route. You gotta love that. You gotta love these parades. Okay. And so here's some of the small independent bakeries. This is the Federal Bakery, which was at 11 South Main. So almost in the basement of the Metals Bank building at that address, you know, the first block of South Main. And it could have been down in the basement of Metals Bank. I'm not sure. And it operated for a good 20 some years down there, the Federal Bakery did. Oh yeah, and this one, if you can read this little sign on the wall today is, whoops, this is what Kim warned me about, switching between things. Today is Devil's Food Day. <laughs> <laughs> and you can see that they sold cakes by the whole or by the slice in these bakeries. They were, you know, and just a block farther north, here's Bishop's Bakery, and it was there in the 1930s. I didn't see it. Uh, I saw it in the 30s city directory, but by 1940 it was gone. But it's uh, it's there. And the Meg's Bakery was a pretty big operation. This photo was taken in 1936, and I don't know at which of its three locations this was taken, but their ovens are so fancy that they have their name inscribed on it, Manx Bakery. Wow. Um, the three locations that they were at, that 738 West Granite building still stands, and it became a grocery store later. It's a brick building. All the houses along that street um, have that Victorian look to them, and there's big ones and there's small ones. And then you run into this squarish brick building, which now has housing in it, but it obviously wasn't built as a house. And so its first, um, its first uh, whatever was this Manx Bakery, and then it became a grocery store location for many years before somebody converted it into housing. And um, so, so that was there. And this was the Parkway Bakery. Um, much smaller operation. You see that their ovens aren't that huge bank of ovens like we saw in the, they have a much smaller one. They're at 214 West Park Street, which is the, they would have been across, no, they would have been in the block that has the KC Hall in it. Mm -hmm. Knights of Columbus is in the 200 block park um, mm. on that side of the street. Okay. Royal Bakery, um, they were in operation for more than 30 years. Um, this picture was taken in 1936. I think a lot of these bakery photos got taken in the 1930s um, as part of advertising for Montana Power having brought in natural gas. And so when they brought in natural gas, we had a whole series of the kinds of businesses that natural gas um, would be a boon to. And so, um, and so you can see the gas piping coming into these ovens. You know, where the, there's the little there's the little valve, and there it is running into the ovens. And so this is the Royal Bakery. Um, they were at 107 East Park in this photo, and in later directories, I found that they had two different locations. So apparently, they were pretty successful. And the 
this Dutch girl bakery, um, this photo was taken, it says, in 1936, um, but I found them in the city directories. They were located on Utah Street from 1932 to 59, and they were also one that had delivery trucks. They were listed under the wholesale bakers that would have delivered to little outlying stores. And here's a shot of the interior of the Dutch Girl Bakery. Um, my friend Lee Driscoll, her father was one of the co-owners of this bakery, and so a lot of its history we have through Lee Driscoll. But these photos are from the Smithers collection. So you can see it's a pretty big operation in the back room. The photo that was in the paper this morning, if you saw that thing about my talk in the paper, was the ladies behind the counter. Um, so you saw the display area of the Dutch Girl Bakery. 1957, they had a fire in the Dutch Girl Bakery. So here's a picture of the aftermath of the fire at the Dutch Girl Bakery. And they did rebuild this afterwards. And so, but the, the Dutch Girl Bakery is listed in, in the 59 directory, but not in the six cities. Anyway, when they rebuilt, it became the Dutch Girl Bakery and the Dutch Boy Grocery. So the Dutch Boy Grocery continued on for many, many years, but the Dutch Girl Bakery, the bakery part of it, um, was closed by 1950, what, by 1960, it was no longer operating. And then the bakery that we all remember, um, Carl Rowan bought Gamers, and Gamers was a lunch, a lunch store, um, ice cream fountain place that also had a huge confectionery that they had run there, uh, selling candy since about 1905. And when Carl Rowan purchased it in the 1950s, his love was bakeries. And so where you see this big um, bakery counter along here, this is taken from the balcony up above. This is where the um, original soda fountain was. And so in the back room, he took out one wall of the little booths where you love to sit, and he moved the soda fountain to the back room and put his bakery counter in the front where the soda fountain was. And the confectionery was gone by 1961, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a minute. Okay, so where did our milk come from? So in 1900, for dairies, there were 33 listings, and I kind of noted where most of these things were located, and most of these, many, many, when you look at the names of the, of the dairy people that had them, um, you will see many, many Italian names, and these weren't Southern Italians, these were Northern Italians, Swiss Italians, and they came from the area near the, near the Alps, and they, and you know, they were probably from larger Italian families that had had dairy herds in their old country, but they were the second or the third or the fourth son, and they weren't going to inherit the family land. And so they came to the New World, and they knew how to raise cattle and these kind of things. So when you find the locations of them, they're called north of Walkerville. You know, it might say two miles north of Walkerville, one mile north of Walkerville. There were like three dairies that were listed in Butchertown, which is also north of Walkerville. Um, several dairies in Meterville. Um, Williamsburg is um, southwest of Butte, if you know that little community. Several were listed in Williamsburg, and those were probably German-owned dairy farms because Williamsburg, all the streets there are named after the Bavaria, and um, you know, they're named after German cities, and these would have been southern Germans from near that same region. So around Switzerland, Germany and Italy and all those countries come together. And so we saw, I saw several German sounding names in, in the names of owners. Um, the foothills of the East Ridge, so up where Columbia Gardens was, and I think one or two of the dairies listed Columbia Gardens as their address. So they were up in there in the foothills and then a lot of these um, Swiss Italians ended up in, in Elk Park. So there were 33 dairies in the 1900 city directory. And I didn't go backwards in time. I just kind of randomly picked. I'll do from 1900 to 1970. And then you see how those decline and decline and decline over time as, um, as they consolidate and um, 
bigger operations buy up smaller operations. Miner's Dairy is the oldest one that I have a picture of. Um, they were already there in the 1910 city directory and they operated until the 1950s. They were still in the 1950 city directory and they were located on A Street, 1539A, and they stayed in that same location the whole time. And that family, um, Meyer family, was probably um, Southern Germany. I'm thinking that that's more of a, a German sounding name than an Italian sounding name. Um, but I love this little picture. Um, you have to know about Smithers, that he didn't have Photoshop, but he, um, if the name on the building kind of faded out in his photo and didn't show up good, um, he took a black pen and he drew the lettering on, and when you draw on a negative in black pen, it shows up white when you make a positive print of it. So, so they didn't have lousy lettering on their building. Um, but you, you have a, a guy with trying to make perfect little letters on a, on a flexible negative, and that's what you get. But um, you can see this is before there were dairy trucks. These were horse-drawn dairy carts, and the parents of the Mayer family. And this little thing in the background, um, Ward's commercial photography. Um, so when Smithers first came to Butte, he went to work for a guy named Frank Ward. And Frank Ward had been in the um, photo, photo engraving business in Butte since the turn of the century. And so Smithers came to Butte as a young man, went to work for Frank Ward, um, broke out on his own sometime in the mid to late 1920s. And then after Frank Ward died, Smithers did purchase the Frank Ward collection from the widow. And so he legitimately did own um, these things. There are a lot of things in the Smithers collection that like people would have an old photo, they'd bring it to Smithers and say, will you make a copy of this for me so I can give it to my whatever. And then he kept those copies of his. So we have a lot of photos in the Smithers collection that date to before Smithers got here. But that's how he came to have them, except for the Frank Ward ones, which I saw the bill of sale. Yes. Um, so when you talk about like, 33 dairies in 1910, are those all associated with individual farms? Yes. Or are there some? I mean, so like, was there definitely a, 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 a Owl operation associated Most with of those dairies story. in 1900 in the 33 were individual farms. They were, it's listed as dairies in the, you know, the yellow pages of the city directory. It's listed as dairies, but when you read down it, you don't see names like Miner's Dairy. So when I found these guys in the city directory, they're, it's named M-A-I-E-R, Meyer. Uh, Gustav or whatever his first name was, and the address on A Street. So I didn't find them listed as the Miner's Dairy until maybe the 1930s. They were listed under the family name Meyer, whatever. And almost all the ones in 1900 were a family's name. And then when you get into maybe some in the 1920s are listed under um, a commercial name like Miner's Dairy or Crystal Creamery or whatever. Um, but in 1900, there's almost none of that. that. And then, you know, maybe a few of these individual farmers would band together and process their milk together, and then it will show up listed as, you know, a, a commercial name. And so, so is it um, fair to assume that in those early years, all of the milk products locally were produced, you know, came from local farms? Sure. I think that is a very good assumption. I don't think any of the milk came up from Salt Lake City or over from Portland. I think it was all produced locally. Cheeses? What? What about cheese? Um, well, I didn't put cheese in here, but there was a company in Butte called Blanchard Products, and they did, I don't know if the dairies produced the cheese. I didn't look up cheese in the city directories, but that would be a good thing to follow up. But I know that by the 1920s, this Blanchard Products was here, and they had eggs, butter, cheeses, all that stuff. So they were buying milk, and they were making the products that would show up in the stores, but they were they were manufactured here in Butte. Okay? Can I ask you a question? Mm -hmm. there, there was um, 
Our milkman was Sam, Sam the milkman, and he used to let us write in the back of his mom. Yeah. No, no seat belts or anything. But he used to take us out to Brown's Gulch. Brown's Gulch is where many of them, when they say north of Lockerville, they're talking about okay. the Brown's Now, Gulch question, did they, just get, did they just get the milk from the farmers out there and bring it in and then process and make it butter and stuff like that at these dairies? Is that what they did? Well, these dairies that I'm talking about, when they're listed in 1900, they're listing the farm where the cows they're are. They're the farms, okay. Yes, they're listing the farms where the cows are. And then did they make it, how did they get the cheese and the and the butter and stuff? Well, that was kind of his exactly. question. And that is something that when I was looking in city directories, um, okay. yes, you know, and the city directories change how they list things. And so in 1900, they would have listed dairies, but by 1930 or 40, then they would list dairy products. And then you would have, okay. You know, so it was a little bit confusing, and so my numbers on those timelines might not accurately reflect just because of the way that the city directories name things and categorize them. And Thank you. I think we'll see another example of that later. Um, yes, Zena. We have a, a milk can in our yard that says Henningsons on it. Yes, Henningsons was the other thing. And that was a producer. Henningsons and but Black Blanchard. The, they milked the cows and then. They, they, took the they took their milk product to Henningsons or to Blanchard. And they're okay, still around in the tea shop. Yes. Um, when, um, well, that's another story. I won't get through the presentation. <laughs> <laughs> this, one, this one had no, a um, lot of things in Smithers were in envelopes where the, the information had burned off or they'd fallen out of their original envelope. So I have no idea where this was. But I just found it interesting, this milk bottling uh, lineup. Um, this is one of the very, very, they, they made it into the newspaper for being the largest family in Montana. And I think when this picture was taken, they weren't all in there. I think they ended up having 17 children. But they were one of the dairy families in El Park, the Perinis. A lot of their descendants are still around today. If you know somebody named Perini, they are probably part of this family. Yes, ben? I've got uh, my friend Scott Perini. Yeah. He has a picture of this whole family, and it includes the younger ones. And they're at a haying operation, oh. and they're all hanging around the hay bale. It is a beautiful picture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this, this this you know, great. you want to have a big operation, you have a lot of children. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. There are a lot of boys in this family, and that's why the names survive, because the girls don't get to carry on the family name. And they did have several girls that could help mom, but they had a lot of boys in this family. And this picture is of the Crystal Creamery, which was oh, at 301 yeah. South Main. So this would be um, across the street and up about a block from Butte High School. Three, Butte High School is the 400 block of South Main. So this is where this is located. And um, this is, by this time, well, it, they showed up in the 1920s and they ran until the 1960s. So they were kind of a, you know, they, they spanned um, several decades, Crystal Creamery. Um, but their products did come to this central location to be pasteurized and um, probably made into cheese and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay, groceries. Um, you know, this is, this is where I had to start putting approximately because in the city directory, you know, I'm trying to count was it two, four, six, eight, ten, ten, and then I'm going, was that a 10 or 12? Because I have to go through columns and columns of little tiny names. So I started counting them in 1900 and then I just rounded them off. So um, in 1900, we have approximately 85 groceries listed in the city directory. Um, Big boom in population, 1906-1907, huge building boom in Butte. So you see this big boom in population, and they go up to 120 groceries. 1918, biggest population in Butte um, because of war production of copper. Um, there's about 200 groceries listed. 1930, we're still growing, you know, because now we're expanding out into the neighborhoods on the flats. We're starting to, um, you know, people are buying housing that is away from, you know, they used to be crowded in apartment buildings and now they're earning enough money to have their homes out on the flats. 
And so as Butte is expanding, they're still building these little neighborhood groceries everywhere. Um, by 1940, now we see the number dropping. And um, in that 170 um, number, we now have six Safeway stores operating in um, 1940. 1950-ish, the number of little local groceries is dropping, 1960. 1970, we only have about 60 of those little, uh, well, there's 60 groceries operating, so some of them are still the Safeways and the, you know, the chains, but the number of the independents has dropped so that the total number is down to 60 by 1970. Um, this little MLY grocery was located at 1959 Harrison Avenue. And, um, and the thing that's interesting, MLY stood for the three owners. And then later, um, uh, Mr. Gay was, ran the meat market for MLY. And then later, he became the owner of the whole store. And it became known as the Cobbin Market. And then next door to it, Skaggs Safeway. And so we'll get into Skaggs wow. in a minute. But now we have two grocery stores right next door to each other. Oh, this one was supposed to come first because I was trying to put them in chronological order. So the Eclipse Grocery um, was, was also on Harrison Avenue, but it was there in the 1910s. By, um, you know, by the 1920s, it's no longer listed. And it looks like a little teeny tiny little grocery store that has a lot of, look what they have for sale, Blatt's malt syrup. They have a lot of Blatt's products on display in this particular one. So maybe it was, uh, I don't know. I don't know what they were doing with that malt products. I'm not gonna measure <laughs> this. Okay, so Skaggs United Stores, um, becomes one of the first kind of chain store operations. And the man, Mr. Skaggs, um, he had a chain of stores in the Northwest. And so he came to Butte and Anaconda with his first stores in 1924. And then they were in stores, they gave numbers to each of his stores. So they were like store number 119 and store number 131 or something. So as he opened each store, they got a number. And this one was located um, on East Park. I think this one is the one on uh, 131, 129 <coughs> East Park Street, I think, because um, I've seen other pictures of it. But um, so by then in 1928, he starts naming his stores Skaggs Safeway, and the Skaggs is in small letters. So he bought up an already existing chain or became part of an existing chain of the Safeway stores, which were not just in the Northwest, but all over the West. So um, 1928 is when Safeways first came to view through Mr. Skaggs, who already had um, four locations, and they became the, the um, Skaggs, Skaggs United stores became Skaggs Safeway stores. Um, when did he shut down his stores? Huh? When did he? Um, well, they, they, they stayed in operation. The, the Safeway stores stayed in operation and are still in operation. Yeah, when did their stores shut down? I don't know that they shut down or if they moved to bigger locations like that one on Park Street. And, and Safeway, as they became more and more successful, started building their own stores that were custom made. They weren't an old existing building that they decided to locate in. They were their built, they were their built stores. And we'll see a photo of them in just a minute. Um, this store, I don't know what it is, but this is what the inside of, a, of an old tiny store would have looked like, mm -hmm. probably from the 1930s. So we have the Pay and Save Supermarket. So remember that Skag Safeway store? There's, there's your building. Um, located at, oh no, that was, the, that was in the 1900s. So anyway, you know this place. Um, so this is where the Pay and Save Supermarket opened. And when it opened in the mid-1930s, um, it was right next door to Southside Hardware. Pay and Save wanted their name to be seen from a long way off, so they got to paint their name under the Southside Hardware sign. 
and then later they would expand. Southside Hardware would move into the building that's now that uh, bakery. Great Harvest. Great Harvest. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Brain cells going. So they um, <laughs> moved into the building that's now Great Harvest, and Pay and Save expanded and occupied both these stores as they became a bigger store. But. Um, so here is Pay and Save's ad when they first opened. And when I did um, a little newspaper searching for the word supermarket, um, this is the first time that the word supermarket shows up in newspapers, is the opening of the Pay and Save on Harrison Avenue in 1935. So they want to explain what they mean by supermarket. And so they say our definition of a supermarket is a large store where goods are wheeled out on display to, in large quantities, priced so low as to create mass selling. No delivery, the present, oh, no delivery, no, no such thing as free delivery, the present high wages of drivers must be paid by those who use delivery, no telephone, which assures you greater savings, no charging, because one charges, he must pay for the one who does not pay, then to a supermarket has 4,200 items. You may buy the best or buy the cheapest. No clerks are permitted to influence. <laughs> so when you went into the other kinds of stores, a store clerk might steer you toward the product that he had the best profit margin, whether it was the best product or the cheapest oh product. God. And so this is Pay and Save's ad in when they first opened. And I believe these, these pictures are of the pay and save in the mid-1930s, and I'm guessing that they're the grand opening because they just show, um, you know, they just, they still haven't gotten rid of all this pile up of boxes, the store is crowded, there's the checkout stand, there's the interior of the store looking out onto Harrison Avenue in the background, and here's another great sign. The government sets the ceiling on prices Pay and save saves you on everything under ceiling prices. So the government would say, you can't sell this for more than this, and all the little stores would mark it at the highest rate the government would allow them. The pay and save is letting you know that they will mark it lower than those prices. Wow. And the pay and save now, because it's a supermarket, you are, can now go in one location and there is your whole meat market is within, within another store. It's within the grocery store. And little local groceries, because we had one in our neighborhood. And he had a little meat cooler that was about this big. And you could go there and you could buy hamburger or a steak or a few pieces, slices of ham or whatever. But you could get your meat for that day's meal. Um, but here they have a real meat counter with butchers behind the windows cutting and wrapping things for you. And this is your supermarket. Get a lot of the prices. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. The bacon was pretty high, 27 wow. and a half cents yeah, per day. More than okay, so now these are the, we were we were, I was talking about when we get to Safeway cool. stores building their own custom stores instead of locating in another building. <coughs> and this is what they look like. They had a, everyone that they built had this look, and there were, oh, there were six or seven around town. There was one on Granite Street in the, two on Granite. Two on Granite, one on East Park, one on, you know, one on West Park. Yeah. So th this is what they look like. So I think this is one that's just been completed. And they always have this long, narrow look with the front on the, on the street that was about, oh, wait a minute. I'm pointing to my computer screen, guys. <laughs> so there's the front of the Safeway store looking out on the street always looked about like that. <laughs> and so these are like the 1950s and, and 60s that Safeway starts building their own custom look uh, store of groceries. And this is brand new. The Front Street Safeway wow. store opens um, in the late 50s. And um, there were several pictures of showing the inside of the Front Street Safeway. And when it first opened, you didn't go into the doors on the side. The front doors to the Safeway store were on Front Street. And I can remember coming in as a little girl, and the front doors were 
right here and you'd come in and the carts were parked here. You'd come in and grab a cart and the bakery was off on your left side. And look who they contracted Gave with it. to run their in-store bakery. Uh -huh. They got a hold, so now they not only have an inside meat market and an inside produce department, they have an in-store bakery that is staffed by bakery people back there. And Gamers is the one who is running the front street. You know, this oh. is the state of the art. They had a oh, they had a huge thing where they invited all the businessmen <coughs> to come in and tour their store. So Smithers had just tons and tons of both the front of the store and the back room in this series of the Front Street Safeway opening. And then jump ahead to 1966, and um, there we go, there's Buttrey's Foods, which is um, now Stokes, is that correct? Stokes Market, yeah. So this is the one that's right across no, the street. Buttrey's, no, Buttrey's, Buttrey's, Buttrey's was Stokes. out in the mall. Oh, yeah. Out of the mall, Albertsons was Stokes. Buttrey's moved to the, oh, is this the one in the mall? No. Yeah. This is the one that's on Harrison, right behind yeah. the new right. Starbucks. Right. And this right up here is, you know, they built the post office there. So the post office is located. So you would know. No. I've got a mix. This was down where, oh. Where the new Starbucks is, that, that building. Right okay. So, no. this might be the one in the mall. Well, yes, I was such a small girl in 1966, my memory's a little bit cloudy. But anyway, we've gone from a Safeway in the late 50s to Buttrey's is trying to make something that's twice the size of Safeway, and the race is on who can build the biggest supermarket. And I'm going to end it there and go to the <laughs> Okay, so in 1900, there are 40 meat markets. In 1910, we have not only little meat markets, but we now have wholesale meat markets that are delivering to all those little local stores. I don't know why 1920, I don't have a wholesale. Um, 1930, eight wholesale meat markets, and by 1930, one of those is Hansen's Packing Plant. But there's also... Uh, Swift and uh, you know there are several farmer. I don't know. Anyway, there's several large, large meat packing companies that are located in Butte in those years, and um, then we come down to um, by 1970 we only have two wholesale places doing meats, and one of them is Riley's Meats on uh, Park Street. And, uh, he's been there a long time. So here's my meat market pictures. Um, this is the standard meat market. And um, so I dated this one around 1900. It was before um, Smithers got here, so he didn't know exactly when the date was. He copied it from somebody. You can see that it's mounted on a cardboard backing. You can see the whatever. So he did a copy of this to um, for the four papers. Oh, yeah. And the West Granite Market was not a grocery store. It was a meat market that operated in the 1930s. But um, they also had a little delivery truck. They delivered your meat in the 1930s. They were gone by 1940. This is, um, and I, I think this is one of the Skag Safeways because look at the tin ceiling and look at the, this isn't one of their stores. And I'm guessing that this is around 1930. And the reason, and it wasn't marked, um, but see the little Safeway store way back there oh, on the yeah. wall? So mm -hmm. this is how we know that it is one of the Safeway stores, and that is the meat market part of the Safeway store. And look at all the employees they have. And there they wow. are again. Wow. And, there, and their decorations on the wall indicate that they are carrying <coughs> the Silver Bow brand of meats, which is hands and pack. That was the brand name under which Hanson had marketed their meats. But um, I don't know, can you see any prices there? They're a little bit higher than that one in the pay and say, I think. Oh, this just caught my eye. I don't know if, I think this is advertising that they got a new refrigeration unit maybe run by natural gas, I'm not sure, but the thing that they're trying to feature is this big refrigeration unit. But it happened to be in a cold storage plant room that has nothing but meat. So I don't know if this is the meat room of a restaurant, but I was just fascinated by 
um, all this raw meat with no coverings yeah. on it, just <laughs> sitting on plates on these the wooden shelves. Yeah. So I think it's a restaurant, but I'm not sure, you know? Anyway, I had to throw it in because I like it. <laughs> Metropol oh, wow. Metropolitan Meat Market. I have to tell you why this one looks gross. This Metropolitan Meat Market was located at 101 East Park, and they were another one that was there for maybe 40 years. But this picture was taken, and it's part of my last time's presentation on feeding the hungry in Butte. So the Joshers Club was this club that distributed food to hungry people. And Metropolitan Meat Market was one of the huge supporters of this food drive that they did around Christmas time. So they have called in every butcher on their staff, and they are processing tons of meat to donate to needy families. And that's why it looks so gross. <laughs> I think they were a pretty good operation. They just and never covered anything. Well, yes, they didn't have plastic. It's it was called, it was good enough. They, they didn't, didn't talk plastic regulation. Plastic wrap hadn't been invented. Um, butcher paper with that waxy coating um, probably had been invented because waxed paper, which really had real wax on it, it was around mm -hmm. for a while, but you know, they just meat they got were wrapped in right. paper after they we bought it. But right. when it was in the storage, I guess they just. <laughs> <laughs> More research needed. Um, this is a display of Hansen's products, and this is a photo was taken in the Civic Center. You can see the bleachers in the oh, background, yeah. oh, and it's at one of what we call the May Fair today. It was a big oh, fair yeah. of people could come and feature their products. It's called and, the Home Show. Huh? It's called the Home Show. It was called the Home Show. Thank you very much, Jim. That's exactly right. And I did that at one time. And um, U.S. government inspected, so you know by this is probably taken in around 1960. That's when those home shows. 1950s and 60s is when this home show in the Civic, well, the Civic Center didn't open until 50, early 50s, early 50s, so um, having a home show in the Civic Center wouldn't happen until the 50s, yes. Uh, there was a uh, Hanson's Packing Company that's still over there on, on West Butte there, mm -hmm. that big concrete. Mm -hmm. uh, my mother used to go in there, and she used to wash down the beef and with the holes. And, uh, you, she might be in in one of the pictures, or Smithers took a gigantic series of Hanson's packing photos, and many of them show, I love them because they show women working at jobs, women working where like can me came off the thing and the women are stacking cans, and there's also women, the women were the butchers, but the women are in the background doing things like washing down. Yeah, so Hanson's was huge, but I covered a lot of it in my last talk because it was feeding the hungry in view, and Hanson's became the big operation that it became during the years of the Depression when the government moved in and um, put people to work in view, you know, people that were out of work uh, got uh, jobs there, and uh, farmers who could not feed their cattle, who could not feed their horses, they were all shipped by rail to Hanson's Packing. They had a big tanning operation there where they tanned the hides of all the animals and they processed the beef into uh, beef meat to be shipped all over the country and they processed the horses into uh, Vitamont dog food, oh, which also said on the label, fix for human consumption. <laughs> it was. But the the, pat, the brand that they marketed their stuff under was called Silver Bowl brand, and there's more of their Silver Bowl brand products. And then this is the Hanson Packing Company after Hanson's um, was no longer operating. Sigmund Meat Company came in, and they're they're located on Hanson Road, and they're there in the 1950s and 60s in the city directories. And then they have a fire in 1960, oh, wow. and you can see this shows the location where they are, um, with be below them and to the north. You know, so this shows that it's on that in that Timber Butte location. And then we move up to modern times. Safeway um, was not only had stores in Butte, but they located their huge distribution center for all their Safeway stores here in the, the Safeway Warehouse Complex. Um, and they've moved, they've moved out of that and 
it's now Continental Truck, some trucking company is using mm -hmm. part of it. Um, but here it shows their meat storage operation in their huge warehouse facility. Okay, good news, it's five minutes till one, and this is my last slide. So um, <laughs> when Kim knew I was doing this, she wanted to give it a catchy title, and she called it The Butchers, The Bakers, and The Candy Makers. And I said, well, I can't do candy makers, but I guess I could. And so I did start researching them, and I found out some really interesting things. And I have a, a couple of show and tells. This is a, a gamer's, a label from out of a box of gamer's candy, and it says, it's printed on copper foil, oh, wow. and it says, this candy left our plant in perfect condition. If for any reason the candy is not perfect when you receive it, please notify us. We will replace it without charge. Wow. And here it is printed on copper foil and enclosed with a box of chocolates. Mm -hmm. And the thing I found out when I was starting to do the research, which, um, Beauty Sweet Tooth, by the way, I think that's going to be the name of my next presentation. <laughs> because when I started to look at confectionaries <laughs> in the, um, in the city directories, you know, there's like 80 or 90 confectionaries wow. in the early city directories. And so I'm going, are these candy counters that were within little grocery stores? What is the deal? Are all these women making their own little homemade candy and you can go there? And I didn't have time to figure that all out. And then you get to about 1940 and it says, um, confectionaries and ice cream parlors is a heading together. And so then I thought, well, ice cream parlors, you know, these aren't really feeding Butte. These are feeding Butte's sweet tooth. <laughs> there's enough information and pictures out there to do another presentation. So, but the one thing I can tell you is that uh, Bruce Shepard started working for Gamers Candy in about 1905 to 1907. And he worked for there for nearly 50 years. And then his son, who was Bruce Robert Jr., and they called him Bob, then he became a candy maker for Gamers. And when Carl Rowan bought Gamers and uh, moved the bakery business in there, um, the Shepherds stayed there with Gamers, I don't know, a year or two, and then um, Shepherds Sr. and Jr. opened their own candy store, which is still operating today. Oh, yes. And um, I'm yeah, I think our summer exhibit, <laughs> or our exhibit that's going to come up when this comes down, is going to feature ice cream stores and candy makers and shepherd's candy. And then I'd like to give another talk then. Kim can squeeze me on her schedule. Absolutely. <laughs> Let's look at the work. calendar afterwards. So I did it. I got it done with all your questions. <laughs> Thank you so much for all you know and all you know.